So let me start here. Uh, just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, our first slide is going to be our self-promotion, meet the team, brief introduction to us um, on who Schwaben is. We'll talk about uh, cryptocurrency. It's the talk of the town, supposedly, as, as Hamza calls it. Um, publicly traded cryptocurrency uh, holdings. What it was and how it's developing, cryptocurrency market caps, fundamentals, blockchain, what it is, the mining process. Really not that critical. It's just it gives you, an, uh, gives you a bit of an insight what's behind it. So we have a, a, a basic fundamental understanding. The evolution of the blockchain, the crypto classifications. Uh, should you decide to purchase Bitcoins? Now we're not. That webinar is not to promote Bitcoin or to uh, promote our services in Bitcoin. Uh, we do not hold any Bitcoin um, for any of our clients at this point. Uh, I hold some um, in my own account, but uh, this webinar is just to give you an appreciation of what it is, how it's going to change life for a lot of, uh, how it's going to change all of our lives. Uh, then how are you going to store it? What does it mean to store uh, uh, Bitcoin and the impact that it has had in a number of companies? So briefly um, to ourselves, we were established in 2010. Uh, we wanted to serve individuals, high net worth individuals um, with a better uh, client care and, and for their wealth and for all the financial advice that they require was really in response to a high commission, high fees, and lack of advisor care. I always call it how the banks have really made a factory out of financial advice and financial services. Investment and wealth, investment and wealth management is what we do. We're a fundamental-based investor. You are offer corporate finance and advisory to owners. You offer estate planning, executorship, and insurance. And we also offer family services. Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy. Just so you know who MicroStrategy is, Michael Saylor. MicroStrategy is a blockchain and a cryptocurrency consulting firm. Their biggest asset is just the fact that they hold 92,000 Bitcoin. That's the biggest asset. To give an insight what that really means, 92,000 uh, Bitcoin, that's, between th uh, that's probably about $3 billion, $3 billion at this point. He says, if you wish me to make a political statement, Bitcoin fixes everything. It fixes government, it returns rationality to political systems, and freedom, property rights to the human race. Now, that's a very big statement. Um, what I guess what he is saying is that blockchain and cryptocurrency has more integrity than a lot of systems that have people involved. Uh, let's start up with publicly traded uh, companies that have a significant exposure to cryptocurrencies. So it gives you a bit of an appreciation of the reality of what it is. Um, anything, whether it was the internet, whether it's mining, whether it's oil and gas or whatever it was, or technology in general, has had always has a significant hype. And then after the hype, uh, a lot of the hype comes off. But I always like to use the internet that in the 1970s was really nothing else than a, a tool that allowed, allowed uh, university professors to share information and research and articles with each other over the, uh, over, the, um, uh, over their own internal university networks. In the early mid 90s, that materialized to, com to be commercialized. Everybody had a web browser, they had an internet connection with a slow download speed. Uh, most of it was not very user-friendly and it was a lot more complicated to use. Today, we transact a lot of stuff that we buy, we actually buy over the internet rather than going into a store. So this has been a progression and we've seen that the internet craze in the early 90s, in the early 2000s, uh, we peaked. The NASDAQ was very heavily driven by the internet uh, craze. And um, the stock market 
collapsed. Uh, thereafter, the, 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 um, the internet bubble burst, and the Nasdaq went from almost 5,000 to less than 1,500 points at, the, at that time. It didn't recover to the previous high until about 14 years later. But some of the companies that have exposure is Tesla, Elon Musk, in his, at the beginning of the year, the year, he said he would actually accept um, Bitcoin as a payment uh, for, uh, for Tesla cars. He reverted, and now he's supporting it. PayPal, more stable, they said, yes, they, they allow you to buy, sell, hold, and pay with for different cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, Ether, uh, Ethereum, or Ethers, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin. Square, it's a company that made that little attachment to a cell phone that allowed vendors to swipe Visa cards. I'm sure many of you have many of you have seen that. It's a very unique device. What they they have branched into a whole number of different areas, but what they're claiming to fame now is is that they hold eight thousand bitcoins. Now to give you a, uh, an insight of what eight thousand bitcoins is, it's about Three billion dollars. Um, so it's 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 a significant amount of money that they have in it, but the whole market cap is ninety nine billion. So it's it's not huge. Mojo is a Canadian company that is going into the next generation of financial services. What that really means is they offer uh, cryptocurrency trading. They offer cryptocurrency management and advice on it. They also offer peer to peer learning, uh, peer to peer lending. Uh, so they they really offer a broad range of services. Market cap is the smallest out of all of those. It's about five hundred million dollars, but it's Canadian. Silvergate is likely the largest uh, a, a cryptocurrency bank at this point. Um, market cap of about three billion dollars. They're the exclusive DMUS dollar stablecoin issuer. Now, for a lot of you, it probably doesn't mean anything. What a stablecoin is, DM is the name of the stablecoin. A stablecoin is a cryptocurrency that is directly li linked to the US dollar. So when you actually hold it, it doesn't go up or doesn't go down in value. So you cannot lose any money when you store your money in a stablecoin. Unless, of course, someone steals it or whatever, but that's what happens everywhere. The micro strategy, we talked about Michael Saylor already before. It's a um, consulting firm. Uh, in the cryptocurrency and block, blockchain space, Michael Saylor is CEO, and really their biggest asset is the 92,000 Bitcoin that they're currently holding, which is about uh, about uh, three billion dollars at this point. Um, Galaxy is a financial institution, um, offers institutional money management services, institutional sales and trading, and so on and so forth, and it's one of the first. A financial services firms that moves fully into digital assets where they basically offer cryptocurrency uh, trading where they offer cryptocurrency funds and so on and so forth so that just gives you a, an appreciation in how big that space already is and how many companies multi-billion dollar companies have put their trust into it this is um a timeline of how cryptocurrency evolved and um, we called it hot and only getting hotter. 1991, the idea of blockchain started up by Stuart Haber and Scott Stornada. And what it really was, blockchain was nothing else than a time-stamped record that they were devising where every record would be connected to the previous record. Well, I'll go uh, a little bit later, we'll go into more details what blockchain really looks like and what it means, but this is just a timeline to give you an appreciation. For 18 years, nothing happened. Then in January of 2009, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who so far still know, nobody knows who it is, apart from whoever is behind Satoshi Nakamoto, developed uh, Bitcoin. He is likely the largest holder of Bitcoin, and he was the initial founder of Bitcoin. It wasn't until about uh, 14, 15 months later that Laszlo 
Ananias bought two pizzas with about 10,000 Bitcoin. So at the time, Bitcoin really meant nothing and it was really, um, had very little value. Uh, if you consider two pizzas are worth like $30. So literally, he paid less than a, a Bitcoin was worth less than a penny at that time. Today, uh, 10,000 Bitcoins are worth $360 million. Just to give you a, an insight in how much uh, cryptocurrency or how much Bitcoin has, has increased in that. The next step was really when um, Vitalik Buterin uh, established the, the Ethereum platform and proposed a new decentralized um, platform and cryptocurrency application. Uh, one of the key issues that it was not just a, a cryptocurrency, not just a coin, it was an entire platform and it allowed smart contracts to be developed. It was actually interesting at that time I wanted to put ten thousand dollars into uh, into cryptocurrency, and I met Vitalik's father, uh, uh, Dimitri, and he told me that his son was going to um, invest. Uh, that his son was developing the next uh, cryptocurrency with smart contracts. I wanted to put my ten thousand dollars in. I said, "Well, if I lose it, it's not the end of the world, but I'm sure something big is going to come out of that." Unfortunately, at the time, unless you were a computer programmer, it was impossible to buy. It was impossible to know how to do it. I should have just asked him to and told him to give me the ten thousand give me ten thousand dollars of Bitcoin either on a CD or on a USB stick or whatever I could get it. And I would would have had about thirty thirty million dollars today out of the ten thousand dollars. Just a bit of a side note to give an insight in how much the uh, how much cryptocurrencies have increased. 2018 blockchain 3.0 was conceived and uh, it addresses some of the shortcomings of the existing blockchain and the scalability. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, what blockchain 1.0 and 2.0 was and how blockchain 3.0 is going to, to deal with that, but it's a timeline, it's an important step in the evolution of cryptocurrency. In January of 2021, Russell Okung was the first NFL player that took half of his $13 million salary in Bitcoin. So it's someone that obviously it's, it's, just, uh, uh, it's an athlete, a professional athlete that has so much um, faith into cryptocurrency that he's taking half of the salary in, in, in Bitcoin. Then we're going in April of 2021, Bitcoin crossed the $1 trillion mark in market cap. And what we've done is we've put a timeline in what it took, how long it took Bitcoin and how long it took a lot of the larger firms. It took Bitcoin 12 years to, um, to cross a $1 billion, $1 trillion mark in market cap. It took Microsoft 44 years. It took Apple 42 years, it took Amazon 24 years, and Google 21 years. So it just shows you the meteoric rise of cryptocurrency or of the value of the cryptocurrencies. In June of 21, um, there was the largest uh, cryptocurrency event ever that took place in Miami, 12,000 attendees, some of the most uh, renowned uh, cryptocurrency um, uh, participants and influencers were at that event. The same month, June of 2021, which is this month, El Salvador was the first country that actually accepted Bitcoin as legal tender and people are able to pay their taxes with Bitcoin. So it just gives you a bit of a timeline. Uh, you see there's been a meteoric rise, but we've seen that before uh, with technology, especially in the internet, and we've seen a, a decline. We've seen that already before. Is it going to happen again? Quite possible. How much, of a, how much more of a decline? We don't know. But what I'd like to show you here, and this is really something that came out in January of 2021, before um, Bitcoin actually reached a trillion dollar market cap. 
it was the market cap of of Bitcoin was seven hundred billion dollars. Ethereum, which is number two block uh, blockchain and uh, blockchain platform, and uh, the Ethers are the, the their coin has a market cap of three hundred billion dollars. Tether, which is a stable coin, which is uh, directly linked to the U.S. dollar, is fifty billion dollars. Binance Coin, the coin by the exchange, is also fifty. So there's a number of of cryptocurrencies that are in the fifty billion fifty billion dollar market cap area. Um, but to give you an insight in how big that market space is, there's currently ten thousand cryptocurrencies listed on Coin Market Cap, which is a big exchange. To give you a, an insight in terms of how things have actually changed and how the market caps have changed in January of uh, 2020, uh, 2021, Bitcoin made up 70% of the market cap of all cryptocurrencies. Today, it's only 40%. Now, we have a poll here, uh, and we'd like to know a little bit more about um, what your thoughts are of the recent surge of crypto popularity. Uh, if you wouldn't mind clicking on, uh, on some of the comments, uh, what your thoughts are. Are you open to investing in in Bitcoin? Are you open before? Are you open now? Um, and what is what are your your um, what are your thoughts? I'll give you a minute or two to uh, to answer some of the, the responses, and uh, it'll be interesting what uh, the outcome will be. You hear it. So I'll give everybody another another minute or two to answer that question. All right, I think uh, most of the people that are going to vote have probably voted. Let me show you the results, what the results are. Um, so 27% were open to investing before, uh, were not open to investing before, but are open now. 31% uh, were open to investing before uh, and still are. Are not open to and uh, not open to investing in cryptocurrencies before, but are now. Forty-one percent were open to investing in cryptocurrencies before and still are. And nobody is not open to investing in crypto, uh, or or nobody is open was open to investing in crypto cryptocurrency before, but now. Now, one word of caution I would like to tell everybody, as we've all seen what happened in 2000 with the internet craze and the, uh, the boom and the bust. Uh, we may be going through something similar. Now we've gone through that two or three years ago. And when I can tell you my, my cryptocurrency account went down by about 95% until it came all the way back again. And it's, it's off by, by about 30 or 40, 40%. It's nothing drastic. It's just enough to keep me interested. Uh, so I just, Thought I give everybody an insight in terms of what what we've had. So let, let's go on. Um, cryptocurrency fundamentals. So Andreas Antonopoulos says Bitcoin is not unregulated. It's regulated by algorithm instead of being regulated by government bureaucracies, or in, and uh, it's uncorrupted. And I would also say not government bureaucracies, but also by institutions. Um, Right now, uh, 
financial services are regulated by uh, by governments and by banks uh, and they offer the security that we that we enjoy cryptocurrency takes any human intervention out uh, on a systematic basis because everything is kept in a public lecture and it's not kept by a financial institution so let me quickly go through just a brief overview what is a crypto what is a what is a blockchain what is a foundation of the cryptocurrencies what makes it so secure so we've put together a um, diagram that illustrates a bit how the blockchain works it's not not something that you need necessarily need to memorize or that is that in, that critical but it's good to understand how it works so we have various blocks and blocks of information it's literally nothing the information in there is literally nothing else than records of who holds what uh who holds what cryptocurrency and how much they've paid to another person and the initial blog is called the genesis block just for general information and insight into how this works the Genesis block is not connected to a previous block because it's a first block. Every other block has a data, has a hash, and has a previous block hash. The data is literally nothing else than the lecture that I was talking about, and it's, the lecture is nothing else than what you see in, in a financial institution, except now you don't have a financial institution that is holding that, but you have a computer network. And there's a whole number of computers that continuously verify all the transactions, all the data that is in there. And when that, when a block has been verified by a number of computers, whoever ha comes up with the final verification on that first will basically create a hash and will earn, uh, will earn a fee in the form of cryptocurrencies. And that is called mining. So it's mining is nothing um, as we normally understand. It's not creating anything. It's literally doing nothing else than verifying all the all the data. This was a foundation of cryptocurrency and how it initially started. So it just gives you an indication the reason um, the blockchain is so secure because all the data in a block cannot be changed anymore once it's been verified there's a, a hash attached to it and it's connected to the previous blocks hash so no one can move the data back and forth or whatever else it's like a safe a block is like a safe and once all the data has been verified it gets put into that safe and a hash is attached to it and that hash is then transferred uh, or that hash is then connected to the next block as the previous blocks hash and the next blocks um, Next blocks data once that has been verified another hash is created and all the data is in there I think a, an easy way of looking at that is it's almost like an annual audit for a financial institution where all the transactions are being verified and once the transactions are done and the auditor reviews everything to make sure everything is correct and, and, and secure. And then it basically says these are the audited financial statements. A block of data is similar, except that it's not an entire year's data. And it's not just the data of, um, of uh, one, one company, but it's the data, all the transactions that have happened in um, in that specific cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's Ethereum or whatever it may, may mean. So that is really the foundation how Bitcoin and how the cryptocurrency started and how that became so secure. Mining process, they could talk about proof of work. It's less critical. I think I've talked about most of it so far. Uh, some of the issue and uh, some of the points here. Uh, some of the details that if you have an interest every 210,000 blocks added uh, is a block uh, as, as a number of coins are being generated when a new block is added and this goes down by half 
ever so often. The last halving for Bitcoin was May 11th, and each uh, block of uh, of in the blockchain, each block of records for being verified was awarded for 6.25 Bitcoin. Now, to give you an insight, what 6.25 Bitcoin is, a Bitcoin is trading at about thirty thousand dollars these days. So it's about two hundred thousand dollars that um, that somebody would get just for creating a verification. That's why there's so such a craze in people having computers that solve solve the next um, block that basically verify the next block in order that they get six point two five Bitcoin. So for just for verifying data. Uh, they get two hundred thousand dollars per block. Um, there's research that says the expert project that the Bitcoin, the last Bitcoin will be mined. The last block of data will be verified in twenty one forty. Now there's a reason why there is a last Bitcoin block, but um, as I've said to a number of people before, as we see uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain evolve. Bitcoin may not be around in its same in its current format in another 10 or 15 years. So where does Bitcoin go? Will anyone will the last Bitcoin ever ever be mined? We don't know. So that's just a side note, my own opinion. So the evolution of the blockchain, just to give you a bit a bit of an insight, you've seen before what the blockchain looked like. Actually, you know what? I've didn't okay so here's a uh, here was just the, the mining process the evolution of the blockchain you've seen the picture just in my previous slide what it what the original blockchain looked like now the original blockchain was a proof of work was based on proof of work that meant the entire blockchain and the entire data set had to be verified by a number of computers it required an immense amount of energy consumption. That's the drawback right now in Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's a lack of scalability, and it was literally only used as a simple fiat replacement process, a simple replacement of fiat money. And it takes quite some time to verify because it has to be verified by more than 50% of the computers. And in order for that to happen, that takes quite some time. One transaction in the traditional um, uh, cryptocurrency, whether it's Ethereum or if it's um, Bitcoin, takes about 10 minutes. Blockchain 2.0 does not have to verify each and every transaction anymore. Transactions are being more localized and they're subdivided into other layers where only a proof of stake is re uh, required. And what that really means. A proof of stake is that you um, reduce the the consumption. Now, this was not really the blockchain 2.0. That's just what Ethereum Ethereum's branch of Cardano came up with. But blockchain 2.0 made it more usable through the Ethereum platform, through smart contracts, platforms, tokens, uh, and as I said, Ethereum came up with their branched off. Um, new technology of Cardano, which now uses blockchain 3.0, which is proof of stake. It improves the scalability drastically because the time is uh, time and energy consumption is drastically reduced, and uh, it uh, reduces the transaction verification that every every computer has to do. So this is just a brief evolution. Now, there's already a blockchain 4.0. And so on and so forth new concepts but uh i think at this point they're, they're fairly abstract that's why we haven't covered it here now exactly what is a cryptocurrency we should have probably covered that earlier on but a cryptocurrency is not a coin so the original cryptocurrencies were coins but they're not physical coins they're literally nothing else than an entry into a ledger system uh, we know that Bitcoin did come out with their physical coins, but those physical coins were literally nothing else than uh, their, 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 the the uh, Bitcoin coins were literally nothing else than a verification of the ledger entry, because that's all really what it is. Um, 
So there's no central authority and no central regulator. As we said, the regulator is a computer network. And a, a cryptocurrency or a crypto coin is not like a JPEG or an MP3 file that has a whole bunch of records. It's literally nothing else than just an entry in a global ledger. And we, when we compare that to current banks, the money that you have in the bank is not you have dollar bills in there or that you have coins in there. You have literally nothing else than an entry into the bank's ledger that says, yes, you own X number of dollars in your bank account today. And that's really what, what cryptocurrency is. It's nothing else than an entry into a, a global ledger. And in the bank, it's in the bank's ledger. In cryptocurrency, it's literally on the, in the ledger of the Bitcoin platform or the Ethereum platform or whatever the platform may be. So um, not one financial institution has control over it, but there's a whole number of computers that actually verify and do the auditing process. And that is what makes it so secure. The reason why cryptocurrencies are so secure is because the cryptography that is behind it. Every entry is encrypted uh, by the blockchain and by the verification process that happens in the in the uh, mining process. And in 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 um in the in every cryptocurrency, there's two keys. There's a public key, which really means nothing else than this is the entry into the blockchain uh, or into the general ledger, and that is being encrypted. So nobody can actually see what the message sees. So I always compare it to the Enigma machine. In order to read that message, you need a key, a, de uh, a decoding key to decrypt whatever the message says. The second, which is a private key, is really a key that says, yes, this is me. I'm now transacting. I'm now paying um, John Doe or I pay Walmart or whoever I'm paying this to so many bitcoins and that message is also encrypted so no one can actually read it and in order to to create that message i require my private key and that is what makes the payment of a cryptocurrency or a digital currency then there's different crypto classifications uh, or crypt and crypto assets there's cryptocurrencies which is what we see in bitcoin litecoin dash uh, and so on and so forth, which is literally nothing else uh, than decentralized alternative for fiat money. Its value is literally only based on supply and demand. What creates the supply and what creates the, the demand is literally just people wanting it or not wanting it. Um, the economic value is based on how much people value that. Um, what comes to mind first when thinking of cryptocurrencies is literally nothing else than that entry. Now, the next one is our platform tokens or coins, which is Ether, which is NEO, which is EOS, and so on and so forth. It's really created on a platform, and it's also a decentralized project. However, each one of those platforms have smart contracts. The smart contracts allow the cryptocurrencies to be paid out to earn interest, to uh, charge fees, or to earn fees for being used. And uh, if you have a platform token, oftentimes you get fees for someone else using your token. And the token is literally nothing else than a computer code that is an instruction set uh, in order for, for um, someone else to do something. Uh, I know it's fairly abstract what I'm talking right now, but um, each in the, in the, in a blockchain 2.0 with smart contracts, it allows a much broader um, application uh, of of what you can do with uh, with cryptocurrencies and with payments in how they're being transacted. To give you an insight, for example, if uh, if you have an airline ticket and you and pay with that uh, with cryptocurrency there may be a smart contract attached to it that if you if your flight is being canceled you're getting refunded the money 
that would be an example of a smart contract. Then there's a utility uh, and protocol tokens, examples of Box, OMG, and BNT. Uh, BNT is a, a Bitcoin and a non tangible token. They're use, usually based on the ERC um, uh, protocol. And the ERC protocol is really nothing else than a set of rules that Ethereum has established in order to um, uh, to understand, to get to uh, to make the set of rules that automate this whole entire process. They're graded for specific purposes and uh, the value is based on the uh, expected use uh, of the intended project. And whether that could be that it's a token that is used for travel, whether it's a token that is used for logistics, whether it's a token that's used in the pharmaceutical uh, industry or whatever it may be. And then there's the purely transactional tokens, which is Ripple, Stellar, Iota, and a number of other ones. And they're literally only created to speed up the uh, cross-border payments of payments. So you would buy Ripple, you pay somebody else the Ripple in another country, and they convert the Ripple back into fiat money or into, into a, um, uh, a stable cryptocurrency or what is called a stable coin. And the benefit of those is literally nothing else than to speed up the entire process. And an example would be if you wire funds to Europe, rather than wiring the funds to a bank, which may take half a day or an entire day, you can send Ripple coins to Europe, to whoever you're paying. They can take that coin, they convert it back, and that can take place within a few minutes. So that's those are the four different types of classification how they are. As I, as I pointed out before, I'm not trying to make anyone an expert here. I'm just trying to give everybody an overview to have a bit of a, an appreciation and a concept of what is behind cryptocurrencies, what the different cryptocurrencies are, what some of the, the terms are, and the concepts behind it. Now, as I said, we're not promoting cryptocurrency purchase. We're not buying cryptocurrencies for anyone or anything else, but we'd like to give people a bit further insight if they are interested in buying cryptocurrency. Now, what we've done here is we've used Bitcoin, but you can literally use any other uh, cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ethereum or Ethers, uh, which is what, what the coin is called or whatever. Uh, now, how would you go about it? And that's what I said. When I, uh, when, I, um, met my, when I met Vitalik's father, I said, oh, yes, I want to put $10,000 into cryptocurrency. Well, I was not a computer programmer, and I had no idea. So I went on to the Internet. I said, okay, I want to buy cryptocurrency. I had no idea where to buy anything. Back then, you literally, there was no access of buying cryptocurrency. As I said, foolish me, I should have just asked my... Uh, asked uh, Vitalik's father, uh, um, Dimitri, as I just said, Dimitri, please give me $10,000 of cryptocurrency and a USB stick, and I would have had it, but I would not have known how to deal with it afterwards. But so the first thing that I need to do is you need to select a brokerage or an exchange, so to say. It could be Coinbase, it could be Gemini, it could be Binance, Newton, Virgo, CX, ShakePay, Netcoin, or Coinberry. And you can look them all up and uh, see how they operate and how they work. And some of them are a little bit more user-friendly and others are a little bit more complicated. The next one is really an optional component. Do you want to lend your cryptocurrency out? Uh, so do you want to earn interest on it? Uh, for that, you need to get a, a cryptocurrency lending platform. You hold a block by your next zone. So far, I haven't done any of that, but that's your number two. And then the third one is that you need to get a wallet. Now, you could be get a hot wallet and a, or a cold wallet. And really what the wallet is, is nothing else than a location where you actually store your cryptocurrency. Now, a lot of people will store it, will just keep it on the exchange. Now, that the exchange would actually be uh, a hot wallet. 
So it's similar as if you buy a stock with a stock broker and you leave the stock in the stock broker's account. So the stock broker is a custodian. That would be equivalent to what your what your uh, uh, cryptocurrency wallet is. Now the benefit is protected by cryptography. So you have a key uh, and a password and everything else to get into it. It's accessible only through a private key, which is which is really your decryption or your password that you need. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, for others to access. However, it's not, not impossible, and that's really the problem. And a number of, of the exchanges and those hot wallets have been hacked, and uh, cryptocurrency was actually stolen. A good friend of mine had a couple hundred thousand dollars of cryptocurrency stolen on an exchange because the ex exchange was hacked. Uh, the other option is uh, a cold wallet. And a cold wallet, what is it? A cold wallet could be a USB stick. It could be a hard drive, or it could even be just a printout of a QR code that basically is the information for your cryptocurrency that has the key, the private, and then the public key of the cryptocurrency. So it's just like that square box they can sca scan in many places. Uh, that could be your physical storage of a of your cryptocurrency. That you just do that printout and then just keep it in a safe. When you need and you want to transfer it, you scan it back into a computer and you transfer it out to wherever it needs to be transferred. The benefit is um, it's really an, it's an offline storage. No one has access to it. Highly secure. However, if the access is lost or if you lose the paper or whatever, uh, your cryptocurrency is gone. So it's not like you're, you're holding it in a bank. Um, I compared it before to, well, if you have cash, you can keep it in the bank, then you know it's safe, but someone can take it and, come, and someone can rob the bank. And um, as in the original de uh, days, you would have lost the money. Today, of course, that's that's safe. Um, but still, it's possible that someone could, could uh, hack into your bank account and steal the money that way. So that would be similar to a hard wallet. Um, a cold wallet would be that you have your cash literally in a in a in a box in a safe at home or under the mattress or wherever. The problem is if you lose the key or the code into the safe, or if you forget where you put them that cash um, into what drawer, you can't find it anymore and it's gone. So those are some of the some of the drawbacks and benefits things. So those are some of the storage methods and risks related to it. Uh, it's more or less just a um, general overview exchanges, which is Coinbase, Binance, uh, Gemini would be a hot, hot wallet, a cash app, which would be um, on your cell phone would be a hot app. Uh, your mobile phone could be a, a wallet. That's also a hot app because your mobile phone is connected to the internet. It could also be your desktop. Now, if you if you disconnect your desktop from the internet, it turns into a cold wallet. As soon as you connect it to the internet, it becomes a hot wallet. You can also put it into hardware. As I said, you can put it into a USB stick or into a hard drive. That would be the example of a cold wallet. Or you can just print it out as a QR code and keep it in the safe. That would also be an example of a cold wallet. Now, before you decide how you store it, some of the issues that, that are important to consider is how accessible does the coin have to be? Do you want to buy it? Do you want to buy it? And do you want to sell it in short order again? If you need the accessibility, a hard wallet is probably the best solution. And just make sure you have you have that very well secured. Um, if you live in a in a geography like China or Russia or or um, uh, uh, very autocratic um, regime, maybe they will confiscate all the cryptocurrencies and whatever you have may be lost through that. Now, because it's on a global network, that will, will be very difficult, but they may force you to give all that up. Now, have you ever lost a key or phone or piece of paper? If you lose uh, stuff like that, passwords, phones, keys, piece of paper, you're likely better off to use um, a hot wallet because uh, or leaving it on the exchange 
there's about 20% estimated 20% of cryptocurrency are actually lost due to a loss of, of um, uh, the device where the cryptocurrency is stored on. If you're tax savvy, spectacular. You can keep it in a hot or a cold wallet and you're likely very well off if you keep it in the cold wallet. So that's an easy solution. Um, if you're highly organized, you can keep it in a cold wallet. You keep it in a safe. Um, yeah, a cold wallet is probably uh, much more much safer. And then you have any contingency planning and disaster recovery. Now, um, it's really what happens if if you pass away or if the person that has access to that wallet passes away. And the best ex uh, example on that was Quadriga CX, uh, which was an exchange. When its founder uh, passed away, he had all the passwords and all the and all the keys to get into it. Any information or any cryptocurrency that was in Quadriga CX was actually lost. And it was billions of dollars that they estimate that was lost. And that was an example where someone didn't give out the key. No one else had, had access to it. And the founder died in the Far East somewhere and took all the money implicitly with him. Impact. We don't need banks anymore. We don't need financial institutions that we have today. This is what Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of Twitter and Square, is saying. This is what what scared uh, Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan, where he said two or three years ago, is that uh, cryptocurrencies are um, a fraud, it's corrupt, and so on and so forth, because he knew exactly that cryptocurrencies would eliminate the form of a, of a bank the way we have it today. Uh, cryptocurrency will decentralize all that. As I talked about before, uh, cryptocurrency will basically become the ledger that was used to be the financial state and the, the books of your bank that basically keep your money. If you don't need a, a financial institution anymore, if you have a large computer network that can be trusted, that keeps that ledger, you're, you don't need the bank anymore and you can just keep all your money there. Obviously, it has additional drawbacks um, to a bank. It'll be so far, it requires more um, technological know-how. Uh, it has volatility. So far, unless you have a stable coin, um, you have uh, you have value um, value uh, risk in the cryptocurrency that you buy. But this is how it's going to change the finance, How it's going to change banking. Lastly, um, we have a number of corporations that currently make use of blockchain. So not of cryptocurrencies, but the foundation of, of, of the blockchain, which is what I've shown you before. Walmart is using it in logistics because that they had very high returns and refunds. In order to see what the condition of every item was in any stop or any point of transfer, they used blockchain and all those records were kept and it allowed them to, to see where the problem areas were, where the quality was deteriorating, where it was mishandled, where it got lost or whatever. Dole used it for food safety. So very similar to Walmart, uh, except that was specifically geared towards food. Maersk, uh, which is um, a logistics company, a global logistics com company, is using blockchain uh, to address the unnecessary cost of pay paper based recording. When you transfer a container or any shipment, you have a paper that needs to be filled out and it needs to be addressed. Maersk is using blockchain for that. Nestle, again, a food company, is addressing secure reporting of, the, of uh, their premium products. JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, who, who didn't want to have anything to do with, uh, with uh, cryptocurrencies two or three years ago, will now actively offer Bitcoin funds, and they have created their own JP Morgan coin. Boney Mellon, which is Bank of New York Mellon, which is the largest, the oldest custodian in the US, has announced that they're now going to offer cryptocurrency custody and integrated services, which is the world's first. 
and Morgan Stanley is the first U.S. bank to offer clients access to Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin funds and Bitcoin trading. This is this is now truly my last slide. Um, where do where will we see changes and transformations and revolutions in cryptocurrencies, in banking and payments? We've talked about that. You've seen supply chain management through Maersk, through Nestle, uh, through Walmart, a whole number of other companies. Through insurance, insurance is literally nothing else than a financial contract, and someone is collecting on it. All that could actually be put into a smart contract and into a cryptocurrency. So that will drastically change the way insurance is being purchased, how insurance is being managed, and um, how the entire insurance industry will be impacted. A lot of the work that has been done, done historically by the insurance company may actually be uploaded to blockchain and cryptocurrencies and will be automated. Travel and transport will be drastically changed. As I briefly pointed out before, if you buy your airline ticket and the, the plane gets can and the, the flight gets canceled, it would mean as soon as that flight was canceled, the airline ticket is automatically refunded. If for some reason, the one plane got delayed and you missed out on your next flight. You could automatically rebook you to another flight. It would all go through cryptocurrency. It would all be be paid for, and you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to run from counter to counter from one airline to another airline. It would just tell you where you have to go next. Another another um, uh, way of using that. Cloud storage. It's really record keeping which is really what the blockchain is all about, will have in, in incredible um, impact. Charity, well, whenever there's a donation that could be recorded, government, how they collect taxes, retail, how they uh, keep track. Uh, we have, today we have big inventory systems or uh, companies like Walmart or like shoppers or um, whoever it may be, has a big retail inventory system. All that could be put on a blockchain. Healthcare, all the secure transactions could be also all, all held in a blockchain. Now, all those blockchains, it's not one blockchain, there's a whole number of different blockchains. Um, but, and each one of them has their own purpose. Real estate, now real estate, they wonder how can real estate, well, the entire transaction process from one purchaser to another, the legal uh, process that you need to do to transfer title, that could all be done through blockchain. And literally all you need to do is offer a token as proof that this is your, uh, that this is your real estate. So you can literally buy real estate the same way as you would buy stocks today. Uh, financing, you could use it for financing. And music and arts, and I just recently uh, saw a brief uh, um, show on how artists in Africa will generate um, digital art and they could never get paid for it. Today, they can publish, on it, uh, publish it on the internet as an, a, to uh, a token attached with a smart contract and whoever downloads that art for any purpose automatically pays for that. And, P and artists that could never collect on uh, a lot of the art that they had, that they had produced, can now make a living out of that. And that was very interesting. I mean, I'm not very much into arts and music, but from a logical perspective, from a payment perspective, I thought that this was very innovative. And it, it um, will make uh, an industry flourish that before had no, the, the, the entire um, Downloading capability and copyright capability is completely eliminated from that. And it allows people that have creative knacks in arts and music to develop and get paid for it. I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, stay, stay safe and thank you. And I'm just have one last uh, request and that's really uh, our last um, poll that we'd like to say. 
just to see what you thought about our, our, our webinar and how much you enjoyed it. Uh, if you wouldn't mind voting here, we would very much appreciate that. Just give us your feedback. Again, I'd like to thank you very much. I'll quickly publish your results. I'm quite pleased with it. Um, I guess somebody thought I could have done a much better job, but most of you uh, gave me a fairly good rating. I'd like to thank you very much. I'm glad you, you felt there was value and the, you, you got something out of it. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, uh, call us. As I said, we'd be more than happy to talk about it, discuss it. But um, um, you, at this point, we're not, not really doing anything in cryptocurrency. We just felt it was important to educate our clients.